for BCH and the JCC for having us here tonight. Um, specifically, we're going to be talking about uh, non-arthritic hip conditions and, and the treatments available for those. <clears throat> I have no disclosures. Uh, I don't receive any sort of financial um, compensation from any sort of device or um, <clears throat> orthopedic companies. <clears throat> Objectives tonight, uh, main ones, know who is and who is not a candidate for uh, hip arthroscopy or hip preserving types of procedures. Um, recognize the characteristics of a hip that can cause a labral tear or pain and, and why the labrum is important in regards to the hip. Um, and then also be introduced to the fundamentals of hip arthroscopy and what its recovery entails. Briefly, a little bit about myself. I'm originally from Pittsburgh, uh, undergraduate at Notre Dame. Most of my medical training was in Chicago at the University of, of Illinois, including med school and residency. I did my sports medicine fellowship at Taos in New Mexico, and then a comprehensive hip fellowship back in Chicago. <clears throat> Um, a very active member of the medical pool for the U.S. ski team, uh, specifically with the U.S. women's team. Usually travel with them once a year um, and get to work with some of these very talented athletes. Uh, hopefully going to Sweden in March uh, pending uh, COVID policies and uh, travel logistics. <clears throat> um, Briefly outline for the presentation, um, we're going to talk about who the correct patient is and maybe even more importantly, the incorrect patient for a hip preser uh, preserving procedure or arthroscopy um, and uh, the prognosis once you've had that procedure. Um, <clears throat> and then uh, what the correct surgery would be to fix the non-arthritic hip problem, you know, identifying the source of the pain, uh, is it impingement, is it in instability? Uh, the main goal being to restore the seal or the gasket function of the labrum and then the correct timing of surgery. Um, when has it been enough non-operative treatment? <clears throat> um, one of the most important things, as I briefly mentioned, is uh, who is not a candidate for hip arthroscopy. So some of the risk factors for poor outcomes after a hip scope or hip preserving surgery um, one and the most important one is how much arthritis is in that hip. And you can argue that almost any amount is too much. Uh, and the reason for that is you can't put cartilage back. That's why joint replacements exist in the first place. Um, <clears throat> some softer indications or contraindications to surgery uh, may be advancing age. There's been more and more studies over the last five to seven years <clears throat> that shows a linear progression of increasing age with increasing risk for hip replacement um, approximately within two years of, of the surgery. So you can see those numbers there. If you're less than 30 years old, you have a very low chance of converting to a hip replacement um, being one to 2%. Uh, however, if you become over 60 years old, you have a greater than 25% chance of, of converting to a hip replacement in two years. And uh, you can argue that it's probably not worth two years of, uh, of pain relief, seeing that one year is probably dedicated to recovery and then you'll need a second operation. <clears throat> some other softer uh, contraindications, there's some poorly understood but identified risk factors uh, associated with poor outcomes after hip, hip arthroscopy with psychiatric conditions, including anxiety and depression and possibly the medications that treat them. Um, increasing body mass index, <clears throat> or uh, obesity, and then actually having duration of symptoms, meaning having pain or symptoms, functional limitations for more than two years can actually make it harder for patients to fully recover to their baseline status. So indications, who is a correct patient for a hip arthroscopy or, or preserving procedure? Um, that really boils down to what the patient is complaining about or what their problem is, the pain is, what things can they not do and uh, during da daily life or extracurricular activities. Uh, that combined with physical exam findings, um, radiological findings, x-rays, MRI, CT scans, um, all get compiled to uh, 
uh, identify is this truly the hip and is this a, a problem that needs to be uh, treated surgically. Um, <clears throat> every, everybody gets at least uh, three months of uh, non-operative treatment and that usually involves minimum of six to eight weeks of physical therapy. <clears throat> Uh, Anti-inflammatories like ibuprofen and Advil, uh, over-the-counter things, or even prescription occasionally. Um, activity f modifications, meaning using more linear non-impact activities, and then plus or minus injections. Uh, we, we'll talk about that a little bit later. There's maybe not a, a great indication for injections in the non-arthritic hip. And as we just touched on, you can't have really any arthritis in that hip to be a, a great candidate for a hip arthroscopy or labor repair. <clears throat> and in the setting of other conditions, uh, in addition to a labral tear, uh, such as dysplasia where the socket may not be adequately covering the ball, you may need extra procedures in addition to a hip arthroscopy to fully re um, recover and minimize the, the risk of failed surgery or need for repeat surgery in the future. And then finally, the indication to, to operate on this uh, or, or fix a, a non-arthritic hip would be that the patient cannot live with it. Um, one of the many, many times in clinic I will tell patients that uh, th this is not a life-threatening condition. And if, if patients can modify life enough to live with it, then, that, then they should and can. <clears throat> so one of, the, one of the more difficult jobs uh, of of being a hip specialist is actually determining whether or not this is coming from the hip. Um, the hip is a very good mimicker in terms of other conditions um, around the hip. Uh, and, and many other things can disguise themselves as hip pain. Um, so you can see on that left side of the picture there that true hip pain is really kind of in the groin in the front of the hip. Uh, whereas a lot of other places that many people uh, identify as their site of pain can be many other conditions. Uh, and one of the, the things that I, I constantly have to tease out is, is any of this being referred from the spine or, or any nerves exiting spine at the hip level? So some of the most common differential diagnoses that I see <clears throat> that present to me as hip pain but are actually not uh, related to the hip, uh, again, is number one is probably the spine, and that involves stenosis or crowding of the nerve in the canal or as, as the nerve's exiting the spine and sending pain into the uh, groin or down the leg. <clears throat> um, other less common uh, uh, differentials there, uh, peripheral nerve dysfunction, uh, a stress fracture, probably more common in, in more endurance athletes, long distance runners, uh, potentially even a hernia um, or a sports hernia, which is not a true hernia and, and more of a, a soft tissue injury of the rectus abdominis and adductor attachments to the pelvis, um, syst systemic inflammatory disease, gout, gynecologic or urologic conditions, and then psychosocial as well. Um, I use a minimum of four x-rays to adequately uh, evaluate the shape and um, <clears throat> risk factors for impingement or instability of a hip. And there's many, many angles and, and uh, uh, measurements that I will make on those x-rays uh, for each patient. <clears throat> um, MRI is also very useful and necessary tool to identify a labral tear. And as you can see, we're looking for a very small, uh, looking at a very small structure and a very small tear in it. Um, that small black triangle that you see out here is the labrum. And that little white line is actually the labral tear. Uh, this is the edge of the socket and the ball. And this is looking at the hip from the side. So this being the front and this being the back. <coughs> Occasionally, I will get CT scans if there is uh, more of a concern for uh, bony abnormality. Um, this is a very uh, helpful tool, um, a specialized CT scan that is um, called a hip map. <clears throat> and it actually gives you color-coded three-dimensional um, modeling of 
of where impingement would exist between the ball and the socket and actually gives you some sort of guidance in terms of uh, how much bone would be planned on uh, being resected at the time of surgery. So why do we care about the labrum? Um, well, for one, there are pain receptors in it and tears are painful. Um, but biomechanically, it has a lot of important purposes for the hip. Uh, the labrum increases the articulating surface by 22%, the acetabular volume by 33%, regulates fluid lubrication within the joint, <clears throat> um, has an important role in joint stability, load bearing, and then most importantly at the bottom there is the suction seal of the joint. And, and we'll, uh, I'm going to demonstrate that here in, in just a second. Um, this is a cadaveric demonstration um, based on a real cadaver in a lab that I was part of, so um, if anybody has any sensitivity to cadavers or, or human biology, look away. Videoing it. Oh, I'm recording uh, it. Tell me why. Go. So that suction sound is the ball breaking the seal uh, when it comes out of the acetabulum. Now we move on to the next slide where part of the, acid, uh, the labrum has been removed in the most common area where labral tears occur. Uh, we've lost sound here. No sound? That's a shame. Let's see if that makes sense. Something's not working. Am I frozen? Computer's frozen. That's a shame. I'm going to have to restart this presentation. Sorry for the delay. We are just getting our um, presentation just froze, so we are just going, going to uh, restart the presentation really quickly, and we will get you right back into the presentation. Oh, beautiful. Didn't fix the sound. I just listened to it before we got here. No sound. Okay. Well, anyway, you can kind of see that the 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 ball is is having a harder time coming out of it. This one after the labrum is repaired. I apologize that the, the sound is not working. Um, uh, I've used this presentation many times before and not had issues with it, so. Um, the correct surgery. So you have to do, uh, you have to identify the correct problem to do the correct surgery. Um, <clears throat> there happens to be gender differences between uh, uh, males and females' hips and the mo what the most common problems are that needs to be addressed. Uh, typically in males, you have a larger cam, which is an, essentially an, an area of asphericity or knuckle on the ball. 
Um, you have stiffer ligaments, meaning less range of motion. Um, you have an adequate amount or maybe even excessive amounts of, of coverage of the socket over the ball. And generally, there's not as much uh, snapping and popping uh, of the soft tissues around the hip. Um, on the other hand, female hips to have to, tend to have much a, a much smaller cam or, or a more spherical femoral head. Uh, they also tend to have more ligamentous laxity, generalized excessive flexibility um, in, that also includes the hip. <clears throat> Usually more likely to have uh, dysplasia or borderline dysplasia, meaning some degree of inadequate coverage of the socket over the ball. Uh, and, and that usually also means that the soft tissues are tighter and you're more likely to have some internal snapping, which usually involves the hip flexor or iliopsoas. Uh, and in general, these two entities are called femoral acid tabular impingement, or FAI, um, and uh, microinstability or just instability uh, of the female. <clears throat> If you look at this from the converse side of things, if you just look at microinstability, what are the patterns that, that fall um, from the vice versa direction? Um, again, typically mostly females, but males can also have it. Uh, they do tend to be younger patients instead of older. Um, that ligamentous laxity picture does seem to be present with microinstability with, with some degree of dysplasia. Uh, and there could also be variances in terms of how much twist is built into the femur. And there's an accepted normal amount, usually between 10 and 20 degrees. Uh, and a lot of times, uh, patients with microinstability will have an excessive amount uh, of femoral twist <coughs> or anaversion. Uh, on the other side, FAI, like I said, mostly males tend to have stiffer hips, thicker capsules or soft tissues surrounding the hip joint, and, and larger impingement uh, deformities. So how do you treat this? Uh, one of the, uh, uh, the main procedure I'll do for micro-instability or an instability female type of picture um, usually does involve some degree of reshaping or a femoroplasty creating a more spherical femoral head. Uh, some sort of labral treatment, usually 90 plus percent of the time that's a labral repair. Occasionally, uh, at certain times, we'll have to do a reconstruction where you make a new labrum out of uh, donated tissue, and I'll get into that later. <clears throat> Rarely do I do uh, have to lengthen the hip flexor for snapping, um, but occasionally that is the case, uh, and I will also tighten up the capsule around the hip joint to give it a little bit more secondary soft tissue stability. <clears throat> so dysplasia, we've talked about this a couple of times without really defining it. <clears throat> There's an accepted normal amount of, of coverage of the socket over the ball, and that's 25 or 26 to 39 degrees. Once you fall that below that, you're in some degree of dysplasia. Uh, there is a kind of a borderline category which we've defined as 20 to 25 degrees. Um, <clears throat> and uh, in some cases, it may be okay to uh, perform an isolated hip arthroscopy with a labral repair. Uh, but we're, we're finding out more and more that uh, it may be harder to make these patients better with an isolated hip arthroscopy and they may need a secondary procedure. Um, <clears throat> in that secondary procedure called a periacetabular osteotomy, quite a mouthful, much easier to say PAO, is always indicated in severe dysplasia, almost always, uh, when that angle is less than 20 degrees. Uh, and if you, if you try and shortcut this and, and, and just get away with a hip scope, your likelihood of failing that hip arthroscopy uh, and the tear not healing or re-tearing is extremely high, and then you're left with a, an, an outcome where you're looking at revision and secondary type procedures, which do, just do not have the same good outcomes that a primary procedure would have. <clears throat> This is a video demonstration of capsular plication performed arthroscopically in the hip. We're going to skip through We've this a little bit just for time's sake, but and uh, and uh, in what it case. ends up doing is putting stitches and through the capsule the component of instability uh, and, and shifting the, the capsule there, up from bottom to top, to which will decrease the amount of uh, uh, rotation allowed in the hip and, and prevent 
patients from getting into more dangerous positions and, and recreating or uh, labral tears or preventing healing. <clears throat> so in the case of femoral acetabular impingement, or uh, which you know was was kind of described as as a male trait, but certainly uh, occurs in females all the time as well. Um, again, you always address the labor, going back to the importance of, of the labor and the biomechanical function of it uh, and the suction seal of the joint. Um, so, and, and that usually involves a repair or a reconstruction. Uh, and then again, the femoroplasty is, is the reshaping of the ball, creating a more spherical femoral head so that any sort of asphericities are not pinching on the labrum and uh, putting patients at risk for repeat tearing uh, of the labrum. Uh, acetabuloplasty would just mean re, uh, shaving down excessive amounts of coverage of the socket. Um, and then something called microfracture um, which will make more sense in a second, but uh, when the ball, when the area of asphericity on the ball is big enough, it gets past the labrum, uh, it can actually start to wear down some of the cartilage, and that's what we think is why this is a pre-arthritic condition. Uh, if at the time of an arthroscopy, there's an isolated area of missing cartilage that goes all the way down to bone, um, a microfracture involves drilling some holes in that exposed area of a bone, it allows uh, blood and bone marrow stem cells to kind of fill that missing uh, pothole of cartilage with that blood and, and creates a cartilage scab. Uh, and it's not quite as good as the cartilage that normally coats our joints, but I, I use the, the metaphor of it's like putting gravel into a, a, an asphalt road. So it's not quite as good, but the, the, the tire doesn't keep rolling through the pothole. <clears throat> Uh, so we've, we've talked about femoroplasty in both uh, treatment scenarios. Uh, the femoroplasty is probably the most important part uh, of hip arthroscopy uh, and it's probably the most challenging part um, and, and probably why it's important to find somebody that really kind of specializes in this and, and we'll, we'll get into that in a second. But uh, <clears throat> There, you can over-resect, meaning take away too much of the ball, and you can undersect, i.e. leave some impingement, uh, and both scenarios will, will result in continued pain on some level with the patient. <clears throat> so this, this is going to be an example of, of residual or under-resected cam impingement. So you can see the obvious asphericity to the femoral head there, uh, the yellow being being that knuckle on the ball. Um, and as that ball rotates up next to the edge of the socket, you'll see it start to deform the labrum there. And over time, that is what will cause a labral tear. It won't necessarily cause it uh, immediately. Uh, you know, frequently these are uh, anatomic variations that have been with the patient since birth or since they've stopped growing. Um, but uh, variations like this can set somebody up to have uh, an acute injury that can cause a labral tear, but it's probably something that's been brewing uh, for a while. Uh, but you see, as that knuckle gets past the labrum, it'll get into the acetabulum, and in that red zone is where it starts to wear, uh, wear away the cartilage and, and maybe put you at risk for some early arthritis. Next example here is over-resecting. Um, and Arguably, this is worse, uh, and I'll show you why here in a second. <clears throat> so th this is somebody uh, who has had ephemeroplasty uh, at some point, uh, and you can see there's kind of an apple bite out of the femoral head there, um, don't, denoted by that yellow dotted line. And as that area of oversection comes up to the edge of the socket, you'll see now it allows, it breaks the seal. Um, and uh, just like any gasket, once you have a break in that, uh, that seal, it allows fluid to leak out and, and, you're, and you're losing the effect of that gasket function. <clears throat> um, the most challenging part of this is you can't really put bone back once it's been resected. <clears throat> um, so this is what I was, uh, was referring to in terms of, um, you know, the, the perfection almost that re is required to uh, 
or the, the search of perfection anyway, to, 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 main, to carry out this procedure. There's, there's a, a 5% margin of error here. So uh, if you over-resect or under-resect by 5%, you'll probably still have symptoms on some level. Um, <clears throat> so it's very, very important to have really good imaging uh, and an understanding of where the cam is and how much needs to be resected. <clears throat> Uh, and, and really, over resection should be avoided at all costs. Worst case scenario, and under resection, you go back and you take some more bone away to remove residual impingement. But you, like I said, you really can't put bone back once it's been removed. <clears throat> uh, so the correct surgery I, again. Uh, th this is kind of a, a complicated algorithm, but this tells you which way you're, how you're gonna fix the labrum. And, and in most cases, it, it leads to repair in the middle there, uh, and then reconstruction, <clears throat> probably second most commonly. Very rarely do I perform just a selective debridement where there's, a, there's an area of torn tissue in the labrum that can safely be removed and still maintain that suction seal function of the labrum. These are um, pictures that, uh, uh, that I've performed of uh, labor repair, a primary labor repair on the left uh, where the labrum has been uh, fixed with suture anchors in the acetabulum. And then on the right is a reconstruction of a new labrum uh, performed with a donated tendon graft. <clears throat> and I have videos of these that are not uh, quite as graphic, I guess, as the cadaveric demonstration, but they are live procedures, so if there's any sensitivity, <clears throat> you can take a break. This is a Dr. Benjamin Dome with a video demonstration of arthroscopic labral repair using the knotless suture tack anchor. Here we see a tear of the anterior superior labrum. We've decorticated the rim of the acetabulum in preparation for the labral repair. We drill uh, drill a hole for the anchor and immediately place the anchor without moving the drill guide. Uh, this uh, results in a single step. Wow. Sorry. This has never happened before. Access to my cursor. Maybe we'll skip uh, that video or, or the next video just uh, to potentially reduce the risk of that occurring again. Sorry about that. <clears throat> so the correct timing of, of, of treatment is also really important. Um, Non-operative management is, is super important for this. Uh, there is, um, make sure I have it on here, I do. Um, Everybody goes through a minimum of three months uh, of conservative treatment, sometimes longer, uh, some six months, a year. It depends on how people are responding to it. Um, but in general, like I said, activity modification involves linear low impact activities. Um, the things that are probably going to make it worse would be cutting, pivoting, jumping, twisting types of activities. Um, <clears throat> physical therapy actually has a really uh, good prognosis in terms of making this uh, symptoms better. Uh, there's about an 82 to 83 percent success rate um, <clears throat> with the physical therapy protocol that I uh, give to patients um, in terms of avoiding surgery. Uh, now that being said, it's not going to fix a labral tear. A labral tear does uh, a labrum does not have a good blood supply, uh, but it can make patients feel better and able to do the things they need and want to do despite still having the labral tear. <clears throat> 
Uh, and things like anti-inflammatories and possibly injections could also be part of that. <clears throat> um, again, uh, the lower impact stuff, hiking, biking is really great. Swimming, uh, with the exception of breaststroke, is good. Um, but with any ball and socket joint uh, on this planet, there will be an endpoint to it. So uh, while stretching is good, if it recreates your pain, you really shouldn't be stretching uh, past it. So the, the mantra of, of no pain, no gain really does not apply uh, to the hip. The pain really needs to be the guide in terms of how much you can and can't do. <clears throat> um, physical therapy's aim is at balancing the 30 plus muscles that cross our hip joint, but really usually focusing on, on core and gluteal strengthening. Uh, those are the most commonly weak structures that can change pelvic uh, tilt and the relationship between the socket and the ball. Um, and that usually has the best prognosis in terms of helping people. <clears throat> uh, this is the that um, research study I was referring to, uh, the, the, my, the physical therapy protocol I use is, is from this study where 82% of people um, were managed non-operatively and significantly improved up at two years with and avoided surgery. <clears throat> Injections I don't use uh, super often for um, the non-arthritic hip, and that's because steroid is not a, a, a very healthy or nice medication to cartilage. I think one time is probably okay uh, if the patient is very adamant about trying it. Um, but keeping in mind, this is a mechanical problem uh, and very likely that the effects of the steroid will be pretty short-lived uh, once that, uh, the anti-inflammatory effect has worn off and the impingement or mechanical nature of the problem is still there. Uh, other injections, uh, steroids the only injection uh, covered by insurance in, in the hip joint. Uh, I have tried other injections, the hyaluronic acid that is uh, frequently used in the knees is not FDA approved for the hips. I do have some experience with it, but it does not. My experience with it seems to corroborate research and it's not that all that effective. Um, and uh, so my, if there was going to be a second choice for an injection, I probably would use a biologic, um, meaning PRP or platelet-rich plasma. But again, uh, I, I don't like or, or see really great long-term benefits from using injections in these scenarios. <clears throat> Um, so what about if you want to try and push this off for as long as possible? Uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, there is some, some research and evidence that the longer a patient has had symptoms, specifically more than two years, the harder it is to make them as ideally better as possible. So meaning that if you compare patients that have had shorter symptoms, they will have better outcome scores uh, after surgery. When conservative treatment fails, uh, in, there is this option of hip arthroscopy. Uh, this is what the, the time of, uh, or what hip arthroscopy would look like. Um, I use three to four keyhole sized incision. Um, it does involve traction on the lower extremity in order to create space between the ball and the socket in order to get the instruments in to, to do the work and fix the labrum. <clears throat> um, the, the table uh, in that picture there, I, I do and have used, um, and that is actually a, a realistic representation of what that surgical setup looks like. <clears throat> One of the most common questions I get is what the recovery is going to look like from this. Uh, typically, uh, with a with a labral repair and no other extraneous procedures, it would be two weeks on crutches, two, a 20 pound foot flat weight bearing, uh, and two weeks in, in a brace, and then begin a stationary bike and physical therapy uh, the day after surgery. <clears throat> Occasionally, uh, a labral reconstruction with a donated graft um, or an addition, uh, a tendon repair would involve six weeks of partial weight bearing with the crutches and delay therapy for six weeks, and that's allow allowing uh, the, the graft to reincorporate into the edge of the socket to become the new labrum and for allow that uh, tendon to heal. Rarely uh, eight weeks would be required for the microfracture procedure we discussed earlier, um, but the, uh, the brace can be discontinued after two weeks and PT can start in six. Um, 
conclusion, uh, hip arthroscopy in the right indications, a very safe uh, and, a, and effective procedure demonstrating favorable outcomes at two, five, and, and 10 years and um, the, the longest research that we have. However, there are, are risk factors that warrant extremely cautious patient selection. Uh, I see hundreds of, of labral tears a month and, and you know, probably operate on maybe, maybe one or two of them. Uh, so, you know, it has to be the right scenario. It has to bother the patient enough. They have to fail uh, the right types of non-operative conservative treatments. Um, and then finally, you have to do the correct procedure. Um, just because the labral tear is there, you have to know why the labral tear is there to remove that mechanical uh, issue so that the, the tear doesn't recur. Sorry about all the uh, technical glitches here, but uh, that's all I have. Thank you, Dr. Chen. Um, we have a few questions that are just coming in now. Um, what can be done to keep the labrum healthy? Um, <clears throat> so it's, it's hard to know without knowing exactly why the labrum may not be healthy in the first place. Um, you know, is it an instability issue? Is it, is it an impingement issue? Um, again, a lot of it comes back to listening to the, the messages that your hip is telling you. Um, you know, are there certain activities or positions that are causing pain? Um, usually the position that will cause pain would be a flexion you know, kind of a cross-legged uh, type of position. Um, that's, that's the most common area of impingement. Um, you know, the, the sports that are, I'd say are the highest risk that I see would be things that involve a lot of hip motion, so dancing, gymnastics, figure skating, um, and then things that would be really hard in terms of the rotational stuff basketball, soccer, uh, but you know, we're not, we're not going to go out and tell all these people they can't play those sports anymore. It's just, you know, some of those sports are probably higher risk. Um, do you have any notes for EDS patients concerning this procedure? Uh, EDS is an extremely challenging scenario uh, with all orthopedic conditions. Um, but uh, specifically with, with hip arthroscopy or, or hip preservation. Uh, and there's, there's a couple studies and research articles out there specifically looking at uh, EDS or, or Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, who, for people who are, don't know what EDS is, um, that uh, have, have compared patients with EDS to patients without uh, undergoing the exact same procedure and EDS patients do not do as well, uh, and, and you're, you're, you're dealing with a biology problem. The collagen is just not normal. No matter what you do, you know, in terms of fixing the labrum and tightening up the capsule or, or performing a PAO, it, it will be uh, more challenging for, for those patients. So I would, I would exhaust uh, conservative non-operative treatments as much as humanly possible. All right, thank you so much. All right, the next question. I'm a 43-year-old with congenital dysplasia. No pain, but discomfort has increased over the years. Um, do you have any suggestions for when they should do something? Um, yeah, so this is uh, uh, an interesting scenario because, um, you know, the, the options that we're talking about here uh, Will like the door will likely close on those in a certain period of time, just because uh, dysplasia puts you at risk for wearing cartilage away at the edge of the socket where the where the ball is edge loading, um, and then and then at that scenario, if this happens at a younger age, you're kind of left with injections and, and kicking the can down the road uh, until a hip replacement, which is not necessarily a bad thing. A hip replacement is a very successful uh, and, and, and great procedure, but <clears throat> it may have its limitations with uh, a younger patient. Um, as far as we know, you know, with this procedure being done in relatively high volume for the last 15 years, even though this is called a hip preserving procedure, it's, it's not called a uh, 
hip arthritis preventing procedures. So we don't have anything to pr prove that we're changing the natural history of the hip. Um, so to go do something about it now because you don't want a hip replacement later really doesn't make a whole lot of sense because we don't know if we're going to change that. You may still need the hip replacement later. Really the, th the, the indication to go fix this should be based on pain and function and, and you know the things you can or cannot do at the moment. Okay, um, another question, and um, bear with me on this question. Um, we have a, a viewer asking um, if you are going to mention AVN. <clears throat> so I didn't get into AVN here. Um, uh, it's kind of a totally different scenario. Um, AVN stands for avascular necrosis, uh, essentially an area of the ball. Uh, dies, and that's most commonly in, in the top, um, kind of a crescent-shaped area in, in the ball. And um, you know, there are certain stages of AVN that dictate its treatment. Um, in the earlier stages, you can core out some of that bone um, <clears throat> and fill it with bone cement and bone graft and stem cell and uh, um, they actually do pretty well, but once you've had enough bone death that the bone actually collapses away from the layer of cartilage, uh, that, that core decompression, as it's called, that, that kind of reaming away the dead bone just does not work as well. Uh, and then you're left, again, kind of, uh, as I said, with the dysplasia, you know, maybe kicking the can down the road if this is a, a, a young age scenario where uh, you're, look, you're faced with uh, a joint replacement. <clears throat> no, but there are, op there are options for earlier intervention, uh, and, and one of the probably most effective things to do would, if there is an identifiable cause of the AVN, is, is try to modify that in some way, if, if possible, to at least stop the progression. Thank you so much. All right, uh, next question. Um, what is recommended for a torn gluteal tendon? So I'm, I'm gonna assume this is uh, <clears throat> the gluteus medius or gluteus minimus, um, which are, are much more commonly torn than gluteus maximus. Uh, gluteus medius and minimus make up what uh, is kind of colloquial called the, the rotator cuff of the hip. Uh, and, um, you know, the, the treatment option, general basics, uh, really kind of stays the same throughout most of orthopedics. And that starts with conservative non-operative treatment, uh, physical therapy, anti-inflammatories, activity modification. Um, in the setting of a gluteal tendon tear, it really depends on how, what, to what degree is that tendon torn. You know, if, if this is a, a full thickness tendon tear and the patient is severely limping, uh, you probably actually want to get to that without going through all of that non-operative treatment because that tear can actually become irreparable and it's a really challenging scenario to, to correct or fix um, if it becomes irreparable. Um, <clears throat> but if it's partially torn or, um, you know, uh, even full thickness tear with, without significant retraction fr uh, from the distance from the bone. Um, <clears throat> uh, injections are, are typically helpful. Uh, I only use steroid in the setting of, of no tearing whatsoever, maybe just some tendonitis or unhealthy collagen. In the setting of any sort of partial tear or, or uh, area of full thickness tear, I would only use uh, PRP just because of uh, how steroid interacts with the collagen of the tendon. You don't want to make that tendon tear worse. Uh, if it got to a surgical scenario, you can fix these. I do fix these. Uh, the smaller tears and partial thickness tears, I can fix endoscopically through a scope. Um, the larger tears that have retraction and may need to be grafted with, um, you know, an extra piece of, of tissue or, or sometimes I'll actually even transfer a piece of the gluteus maximus over to help with that, uh, the loss of strength in the gluteus medius. Um, those, those procedures will have to be done open. And uh, as some of my patients can probably attest to, it's by far the hardest recovery I will put uh, anybody through. And it, it's just, just has to do with biology and, and, and 
of the tendon healing and the physics of, of the lower extremity uh, being a risk factor to tear that repair apart. Thank you so much. All right, the next question, um, this one says, um, what should one do uh, if their labrum is completely missing? Um, <clears throat> so I guess that if that means congenitally, uh, meaning born without one, or has been surgically removed uh, um, at some point, uh, if, it's, if it's a painful condition, uh, I would say a labral reconstruction would probably be the best bet. Uh, basically creating a new labrum <clears throat> out of a uh, donated piece of tissue to restore that, that suction seal. Um, uh, with, without a little bit more information, that one's a little bit harder to answer. Thank you so much for giving, giving it your all. <laughs> um, do sleep positions or types of mattress contrib contribute to hip pain? Um, this, this viewer's um, worst pain is in the morning. You say mattress? A mattress. Uh, I, so I haven't really seen patterns where different types of mattresses uh, make something particularly worse. I have seen lots of patients try many, many different types of mattresses. Um, <clears throat> uh, hip pain in the morning, um, you know, could be a couple of things. It could be arthritis, which is usually a little bit stiffer uh, in the morning and then may get up better throughout the day. Um, trochanteric bursitis or some of the, maybe some of that gluteus medius minimus tendon tearing often wakes people up at night. Um, but in terms of a specific mattress, <clears throat> there's really nothing out there in terms of, uh, you know, the hip research world that says, you know, hard or soft or, or that sort of thing is better than, than the other. So it's really going to be kind of a, a trial and error, unfortunately. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Um, the next question is, um, this, this viewer has um, dysplasia, and uh, they keep seeing the recommendation for biking, but every time they bike, they experience a deep hip pain. Um, any suggestions for them? Sure. So, um, yeah, as, as they've been recommended. Typically, biking is a very, very safe and um, non-painful activity. However, uh, it, everything goes back to what I said before in terms of listening to your hip. If it is painful, uh, that situation needs to be re-evaluated um, because pain is is probably the recreation of an impingement moment or, or you know, it's just not something you should be pushing through. Um, if it is painful, you may just be unlucky enough that biking is not a good activity for you. However, uh, one thing I could suggest is uh, if you haven't done it already, um, seeing a professional bike fitter to make sure that the seat position is, is ideal because typically what will happen when biking is painful is the seat is too low uh, and the pedal stroke forces the leg up too high and that will create too much flexion at the hip joint and, and put the poor person more likely into a, a hip impingement scenario. Okay, the next one. Um, this person says they have a labral tear and have had PRP, which was marginally and temporarily successful, but the pain came back. Um, what are their chances for selection with this treatment? For what? Selection. Selection for surgery? Um, probably quite good. Uh, you know, it, it, again, without seeing images, talking to the patient, going through the exam, I really can't say f for sure. But, you know, you go back to that slide that one of the most important things is clinical history. You know, is this truly coming from the hip? Uh, and um, is, is the pain bad enough that it needs to be addressed surgically? And is there any reason not to do it? So arthritis being the main hard no. Um, uh, and some of the softer calls are, you know, uh, like, like age and, and um, 
BMI and, and duration of symptoms, those are all things that patients should be educated about before going into surgery to know, you know, what are the chances that I get better or, or how much better am I going to get? Those things can, can change that answer. Um, but <clears throat> just uh, knowing that uh, the person has had PRP with a marginal short-term duration. I can't really say for sure what what indica uh, surgical indications would be. Thank you for that. Uh, the next question is um, from a former dancer and gymnast. Um, would hip replacement restore lost range of motion from an FAI or labral tears? Um, so typically, uh, by the time somebody needs a hip replacement, uh, hip motion has dramatically been, been impacted. And that's because of multi multiple variables, one, one being pain. It's just painful to move an arthritic hip. But there is also geometrical mismatch. You know, the, the ball and the socket develop bone spurs, which actually create a you know, not quite square peg round hole, but a mismatch in terms of how the ball relates to the socket and, and that will inhibit motion. Um, <clears throat> so typically motion does improve with a hip replacement. Now, does it go back to what a person once had to be able to do gymnastics and dancing? Um, I don't know for sure, but I could, uh, I might even say that I honestly hope not. Uh, you know, the, the hip replacement is not quite as stable as a native hip. So one of the things you worry about with hip replacement is dislocation, the ball popping in and out of a socket. Uh, so while you want to improve motion, uh, restore normal motion, you know, a lot of times dancers and gymnasts and people very passionate and good at their sport actually have uh, supraphysiologic hip motion, which gets them in trouble in the first place, so. All right, Dr. Chen, um, we are going to just take one more question and then we're gonna end the presentation this evening. Sure. Um, if I'm not a good candidate um, for this procedure, what are my options? Sure, so um, yeah, the, the, the topic obviously today was mostly hip preservation and hip arthroscopy, labral tears. Um, if, you, if there are too many risk factors piling up that you're not a good candidate for it, um, you know, the injection scenario is, is always, uh, all, um, is frequently a good one. Um, if there's too much arthritis, uh, as I briefly mentioned, uh, a, a hip replacement is, uh, a very predictable procedure um, with probably some of the best surgical outcomes of any surgical pr procedure even outside of, of, of orthopedics. Uh, and we've really kind of dialed it in, um, you know, uh, to do an anterior approach, come between muscles, uh, use robotics to improve and, and maximize the accuracy and, and precision of implant component placement. Uh, younger, healthier patients, you even do this outpatient. Um, you know, hip replacement surgery takes place at <clears throat> 7.30 in the morning, uh, you wait for the spinal anesthetic to wear off, you do physical therapy probably four or five hours later and, and you go home uh, later that day. Uh, so it, it's really kind of come a, a long way and, and people look at it as, a, as, a, as like, oh no, I need, I need the hip replacement. But honestly, it's a much, if you're not a candidate for a hip arthroscopy, it's actually a much easier procedure. Uh, you're up and walking on it right away. There's no brace. Uh, there's no prolonged period of time of, of healing, like with, in terms of the labrum healing to the socket. I mean, there's obviously some soft tissue healing. Um, but uh, that's probably the most common um, backup plan if, if somebody is not a candidate for a hip arthroscopy. And we've come to the end of our time. A recording of tonight's lecture is available at bch.org slash live stream. You will receive a post-lecture survey by email. And please take a minute just to fill that out. And again, please visit bch.org 
for information on COVID-19 vaccination. And thank you so much for joining us this evening. And thank you, Dr. Chen. Thank you.